Welcome to Drinks, Jokes, and Storytelling, the ESPN for all things comedy, with your hosts, Mark Riccadonna and Richie Byrne. And now, grab a drink, and welcome, Mark Riccadonna and Richie Byrne. Hey, welcome to Drinks, Jokes, and Storytelling. I'm your host, Mark Rigadon, and with me as always is a, it's a Not black Richie screen. Bird, it's Tom Bannis. <laughs> How are you guys? I'm good. I love it. Richie couldn't make it, and your video isn't working. So that's... Mark, how are you doing today? Can you hear me? I can hear you. I can't see you, though. <laughs> Richie had a... Uh, another commitment that he had to be at so he couldn't uh join us today but that's fine we got a we we actually brought in two guest hosts which i think is uh pretty awesome they're uh friends of the shows so everybody out there probably knows them um you want to bring them right out yeah and i feel like you guys are all rock star comedians so let's bring out the two <laughs> other rock star comedians craig gas and don jameson Welcome to it. Perfect. How are you, boys? Tom, you've never looked better. <laughs> <laughs> What's up, boys? Oh, oh man. Things are good. Craig, I missed you because we I, I actually hung out with Don in Nashville and we were hanging out, and that was the only thing we were missing was Craig Gast on the comedy show. Dude, that place rules, man. That place, the wind down. Uh, Don and I did some shows there, and it was, it's funny. It, it reminds me of uh, the three of us went all the way to Europe to do some military shows. And then there was one night where there was some miscommunication from the military people, and they took us to a bar. <laughs> and they said, Yeah, so this is it. And we're looking around, we're like, We're just performing in a bar? And they're like, Yeah. And we all each other, like, Shit, how many times have we done this? So it's, yeah. <laughs> We went we went all the way to Spain to do a Bix gig. <laughs> <laughs> but, for, and and perform for Girl Scouts. Yeah, was yeah. We ended the tour with a Girl Scout show. Like literally. Not even like I, making fun of a branch of the military and saying, Oh, these are the Girl Scouts. Yeah. They were the real Girl Scouts. So I gotta I gotta back up and explain that because that, that is such an amazing story. Our last date of that tour was in Portugal. Was that where it was? No, Madrid. Madrid. Oh, that's right, because they took us to the, the soccer Portugal game. Portugal first, yeah. Went to Real Madrid. The guy picks us up. We have a, a point of contact in every city that we fly to with the local military. And our point of contact picks us up at the airport and says, I hope you guys are ready to put it out there for the Girl Scouts. We're like, yeah, the fucking Girl Scouts, man. We're going to do it for the Girl Scouts. <laughs> that was like a, a running joke. And he kept bringing up Girl Scouts, and we just thought, yeah, we – we thought he was marginalizing his fellow. Yeah, like he was a Marine making fun of the Navy or something. Yeah, yeah I hope you guys are ready to perform for all of my bitches back on the base. And we're like, <laughs> the Girl Scouts. And then he, he takes us to a soccer game. We actually spend like almost 48 hours with this guy not understanding that it was not a joke. And I was in the front of an SUV. And all the other guys are in the back, and uh, I, I'm making small talk with our military guy, and he's driving us on the base. And as we start to slow down and pull into this part of the base where it looks like we're going to be performing at, I look and I go, what's with the fucking bouncy house? And he goes, for the Girl Scouts. And I go, <laughs> is this like real Girl Scouts? And he goes, yeah. And you guys are all laughing in the back. And I remember like doing this dramatic, like, guys, shut up. Shut up. <laughs> it's real Girl Scouts. Like, for real. Real Girl Scouts. And um, I'll never forget Don saying to me, uh, it was so accurate. I, I couldn't put my finger on my fear that I had. Don looked at me and said, dude. I know you know this experience. I've performed in biker bars. I've opened up for the biggest heavy metal bands in the world. I've never been so scared in my life as I am right now. And I was like, <laughs> oh, my God. 
Yes. yes, that's how I feel. This is like a level of fear <laughs> that is unparalleled. And you guys threw me out there to go first. Because <laughs> of course. Of and uh, so I'm like, I go, hey, everybody. Um, and by the way, all tiny little Girl Scouts in the front, all their parents watching and ready to judge us in the back. Right. Yeah. And, and, their, and their younger brothers sitting on their mom's lap. Yes. Yeah. So there's literally well, four year olds sitting. There. You know what though? You gotta look at the 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 positive of the whole thing. All of those girls got their kiss badges that day. <laughs> <laughs> they, all became, they all became Metallica fans and yeah. So <laughs> four four headlining comedians, four headlining comedians with about a hundred years of comedy experience backstage which yeah. was just another room in the elementary school we were performing in, yeah. just sweating like, you know, like we're withdrawing from meth. Yeah. It was, it, we, were, we were crapping ourselves, but we're like, well, at least the one thing Craig has is the funny voices. He could do the yeah. impressions. Even if they don't know what they are, they'll yeah. laugh at them, and then we'll figure out what the hell we're doing after that. Yeah. yeah, you do do Tracy Morgan and, yeah. and <laughs> dangle a rope in front of them. <laughs> the thing is that at that age, those kids didn't even have any concept of like any of the like all they know is cartoons. Yeah, and I'm going out there with like I'm reaching with like, hey, you guys, you want Christopher Walken? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you had Gilbert Gottfried, wasn't he the bird in Aladdin? True. Yeah, I just I just remember going up in my first just to get a feel for the audience. I said, uh, um, "I am a stand-up comedian. Do you guys have a favorite stand-up?" And that's when I realized they had no idea what stand-up comedy was. Like, oh, that was right. That was so, dude. It, it's still. It, it's funny. By the way, I want to point something out. The guest that you have for today's show. Yeah, I, I've been thinking about this a lot in the last uh, couple of days since you asked me if I could join this thing. Is uh, I remember we were discussing when we were in Europe, at least I remember from my point of view saying, dude, what we're doing right now in Europe is what I thought my life was going to be like. When I first realized that, that I might be able to make a living doing stand-up comedy, I thought, oh, man, I'm going to be surrounded by the funniest people in the world, like the happiest I, I had no idea how naive I was to think that it was going to be like a laugh riot everywhere I went until we all went to Europe together. And that felt like what I thought stand up comedy, the life of a stand up comedian was going to be. We were all copacetic. We were all just like on the same page laughing. We also bonded over a girl that was screwing all of us over. And we were like, and we, and we just had this amazing uh, male Wouldn't bond. this story be so much better if the word over wasn't in that? Uh, We're yeah. all bonding over a girl who is screwing us all. <laughs> <laughs> but the uh, uh, the the guy that we have on the show today is the rock equivalent of that with two other guys in Nashville. This guy is an accomplished musician who um, uh, him and what seems to be two of his best friends play in Gene Simmons solo band and Ace Freely solo band. And it seems like the three of them are just uh, as copacetic with each other as we are. And it just seems like, God, if I knew how to play an instrument, if I had any talent whatsoever, I would hope that I would land in a spot like this guy is. And that's Jeremy Asbrock, who um, uh, is known, uh, has always been known as one of the go-to guys with the rock and roll residency out in Nashville, and now he's got these cool gigs who him and his two best friends all grow up loving Kiss, and they end up playing in bands with Gene and Ace Freely, which is amazing to and, me. And now a stand-up comedian as well. Yep. <laughs> well, let's right, bring him up. Bring Jeremy in so he can do his act for everybody. Jeremy, go ahead. <laughs> Get started. Uh, oh, I'm not going to kick right off. In fact, uh, we talked about, we were going to talk about uh, dumbest things you've ever done because i yeah I, I landed a king daddy on friday and it just kind of led me to telling my six-year-old son you know my short list of dumbest things i've ever done <laughs> and it, I, i've been thinking about that stuff a lot lately and i mean 
Was I, 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 dumb, dumb stuff is pretty funny. <laughs> oh, I mean, as a, a rock musician traveling the world, I, you have to have some doozies, you know, because tour life is so much different. This has nothing to do with music, rock and roll. Although there is one thing on my dumbest things I've ever done list that does involve music and rock and roll, but the rest of it, not so much just being a, a overloaded parent and husband. <laughs> <laughs> what's the dumbest thing uh well i'm not gonna put them in order i'll tell you this most recent one uh so <laughs> you know i'm sure you all saw in the news that lots of tornadoes ripped through tennessee and kentucky and everything well i mean nothing touched down here but the winds were really high and i lost about a third of a cedar tree hmm. Oof. so i've always been pretty scared of chainsaws i mean i'm a guitar player I did work in a cabinet shop for about two and a half years, so I've used saws, but I quit doing that because I got everything. I'm out. <laughs> you uh, have to insure all those. <laughs> so this thing sat in my yard for about three days, and I was like, man, fuck, I'm going to have to do something about this. So I bought a chainsaw. This is about noon. And... I actually got the tree taken care of. I got it cut up. I got it to the front of the yard to be picked up. And yeah. but now we can't. Really, now we can't make a diminished cord. And uh, <laughs> I got, it's like, wow, you know what? That, that wasn't so hard. You know, it's being kind of careful. And I'm gonna go to the backyard and get rid of some stuff that's been pissing me off. I'm like, okay, <laughs> got rid of that stuff. Like, so my house has brush on each side. So, you know, some of it's pretty overgrown, needs to be peeled back. I was like, you know what? This fucking chainsaw will just melt right through this stuff. So uh, I'm squatting down, and uh, I'm wearing a pair of pants that has a hole in the knee. I'm squatting down, and I'm just cut, fucking cutting right through that stuff. And I mean, the blade just barely touches my knee. <laughs> and because I'm bending or I'm squatting down and the skin is stretched over my knee, it just goes. Oh, oh fuck! Oh god! Oh. <laughs> so, uh, I'd Mark's like to, laughing. I'd like to. Oh no! I want you to laugh. This is funny as fuck. Uh, <laughs> I'm just thinking he's not going to be doing any David Lee Roth jump kicks. <laughs> I think this is the beginning of this is like an origin story for Jackal. I, I didn't realize. Well, I told you. I told you that I bought the chainsaw at about noon. So this is about two o'clock. I have to be in line at my son's school at 2.30 because he gets out at 3 or I'm going to be in a fucking line that goes out the street and down the block. <laughs> so I'm like, oh, fuck. And Hannah's not home. My wife's not home either. I'm, I'm, I'm by myself. So there are 12 steps that go from my backyard up to my back deck. And I cut my knee and I'm just like, oh, fuck. Oh, because I see it. And I know I'm going to need stitches. Like, I know it's bad, but I don't know how bad. So I cut my knee, like, kind of hobbling up the steps, fuck, and out loud, just, oh, fuck, oh, fuck, oh, fuck, oh, fuck, like a mantra. And <laughs> and now I've got to find my phone. I'm like, fuck, fuck. Well, no, first I get a wet towel to apply some pressure and, you know, soak up some of the bleeding. And then I've got to find my phone. And then i got to call my wife. And I'm not panicking, like, hey, babe, I just cut my knee open this goddamn chainsaw. I need you to come get me. Oh shit, okay. And then I'm like, okay, now I've got to find somebody to get my son. So I'll call our friend, like, hey man, I need you to get Roy from school. I just cut my knee open with this goddamn chainsaw. He's like, oh shit, okay. And then I have to text my son's teacher to tell her that that's happening in 45 minutes. <laughs> it's a lot of work under the pressure of a split I don't, open I have, knee. I don't have a chat thread with her, and her contact number is not easy. So I've got to hit new message. Miss uh, wasted text. And Jeremy hey, so is picking up my son from school today. Thank you. And unaware then, that, that that same teacher is just casually texting child protective services in two seconds. <laughs> just uh, no, no, man. I gave her an autograph picture of Ace Fraley. I, I, I I'm good. I'm good <laughs> and some and some guitar picks. Oh uh, my god. And and then I get the chainsaw. 
No, what did I do next? Now I'm kind of like just starting to, oh, I, I just sit on the front porch and wait for my wife to come get me. And here's the amazing thing. Uh, I guess we don't have nerve endings in our kneecaps because it never hurt. The cutting it open never hurt. When I was sitting there with my hand on it, never hurt. The only thing that hurt from the actual injury through the healing was, you know, getting the, the shots to put the stitches in and cleaning the wound. Wow. And then when your wife like, I, I was kind of freaking with... out. That's why I was able to have a, a sense of humor about him. Like, this doesn't hurt. <laughs> that's weird. Started putting stuff in the cut. But <laughs> I had just used the fucking hedge trimmers, which there, I have. There's three comics. Ever would have happened. There's three comics sitting here right now going, that'd be a new 10 minutes in our act. <laughs> I mean, and you know, like the worst part is like how big of a fucking idiot I feel like. That that was a totally avoidable. Yeah, that was dumb. <laughs> <laughs> I have to say that it wasn't as bad as I thought it was going to be. I mean, that is that is a dumb, bad injury. I'm glad you're okay. But oh, when if I'd hit the bone, we'd be having a completely different fucking conversation right now. <laughs> You'd be Just coming the, in from the hospital. <laughs> the story of you thinking, like, you know what? I did a pretty good job with a tree. Let me go. Uh, let me yeah. go. Use this for some more stuff. I thought this was going to lead to like, and then all of a sudden the house just started tilting. And I was like, oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> this yeah. car could use a little detail work. <laughs> no, it was only my knee. I got to, I got to point ah. out, uh, Jeremy, you're always uh, associated with your, your two buddies that you're um, always in bands with. Are you guys best Actually, friends? I have to jump when I have to jump because I have to go meet with them. Okay, oh, cool. How long have you got to hang out with us? Uh, I can't see the time on my phone. Uh, so. It's got uh, it, for our time uh, two fifteen. Okay. So. so, are you guys best friends? You and Ryan and Philip. Yes, we are. Is is has as a matter you, of fact, like Philip and I hung out for about ten years before we ever played a note together, and then that only started with like tribute bands and just you know having fun and stuff. Uh, none of us pursued this together. It all happened by having fun. Big rock show with Ryan. You know, I did join that band because, you know, they had gotten hired for the Kiss Cruise at that point. But, you know, I, I was going through a divorce and living with Philip, and Philip lived three blocks from where Ryan worked. So it was like I met my new best friend, and boy, did we rip it up for a year. <laughs> yeah. And then. You know, yeah, it was just all hangs, and um, it, it it just grew into this. We yeah, never friends. like deliberately put a project together to try to do anything. Yeah, Craig made a good point, man. Like, you guys are the epitome of what musicians would want to get into the business. Same with comedians. Like, you think, oh, all comedians are going to be fun and hilarious, but they're not. You, you usually most no, comics... and like even the musicians are are in that too. I mean, look, man, I've been on many tours with you know you get put together with these people for other artists or, or bands or, or whoever, and it's fun. You know, it's never not fun. Although well, I take that back, sometimes it's not fun. <laughs> uh, most of the time, there's a camp aspect to it, but it's still like not doing it with your dudes that you talk to every day and hung out with all the time prior to that. Yeah. Well, it's, it's funny because, uh, you know, when I mentioned that before I got into comedy, I thought, man, holy shit, I could do this. And I'll be around the happiest people ever. It'll be like such a fun vibe. Before that, when I was a teenager, I can remember, and I know tons of friends of mine were like this. You're hanging out, you're smoking weed, and listening to your favorite rock and metal albums growing up and just thinking, how cool would this be? We should form a band. But yet none of you have any talent, and none of you know how to play a fucking instrument. But the dream is, how cool if it was, would it be if all of us had a band and we traveled? And like, and so that's, that's a rare thing to actually hit that, to be an accomplished musician with your best friends. I, I don't know of any other... I mean, they're, Craig, they're, you just described me doing comedy. I have no talent, but I was like, well, I'm going to do this. I would like to add that one thing that doesn't get factored in is creative differences. We're not creating anything. We're just out riding a fucking fun roller coaster. You know, if True. we were 
like a real band, I don't know, trying to make new music right. or whatever. I, I don't know. that w When that gets factored in, that changes things a little bit. But when you're just out playing for fucking Gene Simmons and Ace Fraley, who you've been listening to since you're a little kid, yep. I don't know. It just makes it a little different. <laughs> but you still, there's still guys who, even in those situations, who just don't get along. I mean, it's like just because musically you can dovetail together and, and be able to hit something that sounds right doesn't mean that uh, outside of playing together that you guys are going to get along. I know well, man, that. Like, the thing is, is uh, you know, we're all very different people, but our personalities are more similar than uh, dissimilar. You know, we're all laid back dudes who just don't want to have confrontation and just want to get along and have a good time and do our thing. I know just in Don's experience of working on that metal show, I know he's holding some secrets that he's going to put out in a book like 30 years from now. <laughs> the shit that he, because I've only heard a couple of stories about shit that was going on behind the scenes with certain artists that I'm like, I, well, I keep saying I'm going to. He, oh, he froze like that. That was the best. I know. When, when I'm, when I'm at, I always say when I'm out of the business, I'll write the tell tell all book. But then I just realized I just played a wine bar and a dog show two weeks ago. <laughs> Pretty sure I'm already out of the business. <laughs> I have to get in first till I can get out. <laughs> so uh, when the you last oh, you go ahead, Craig. Uh, I was no, I was gonna say there's something they told me when we were all in Nashville last summer. Uh them describing, because you guys grew up in Nashville, right? Well, I did. Uh, Ryan grew you, up in Topeka, Kansas, and Philip kind of grew up between Nebraska and uh, Decatur, Alabama. Okay, like, so, and then you guys all end up in Nashville playing together how long ago? Uh, well, Philip and I started doing things together 10 years ago, and... And right, actually, Ryan and I about ten years ago, about ten ten for both of them. But Philip and I had had you know about ten years of hanging out prior to that. So I guess it's more specific to you then. Growing up in Nashville as the biggest Kiss fan in the world, and you not only end up playing uh, with Gene, Gene flies to your town, the town that you you grew up loving Kiss, where all of your Kiss memories are in that city, and Gene Simmons flies to your town to rehearse and put this band together that that's and what was it sir in nashville yeah. Guys, yeah. i mean it's it's um it's such a surreal experience and and personality wise did it take you a while to kind of get over the excitement to chill or did you uh by the time you start playing with gene have you already figured out how to just be cool around certain people oh i figured out how to be cool but uh Sure. Not with a chainsaw. Fucking, you did. On the inside, though, I'm <laughs> flipping out and like you know a little bit scared because he's he's intimidating, yeah. and you know he goes right for you with his ball busting, and you know you think you're, you're too scared to to bust back, but then you realize he kind of likes it. So the first time I had to give it back, I was fucking terrified, mm -hmm. but then he just went. <laughs> and then, and then, it just got easier over time. I wonder what that would sound like, Craig. I was just thinking, I, I do have a story from <laughs> a week ago, like a week in, well, I guess it was like two weeks ago. Um, uh, Dean Snowden, who works with KISS, texts me. He knows I'm in Vegas. And he goes, hey, man, <clears throat> Gene is at KISS Mini Golf. Uh, do you want to come down and, and hang out with us? And I was like, and I was, I'm always hesitant. I'm always scared. Like, oh, this is the moment. Th this is it. Now, this is, he's going to trap me at Kiss Mini Golf and he's really going to lay into me. But uh, I go Can over. I hit you with one of the clubs. <laughs> yeah. I was actually scared. And I talked to a comedian friend of mine, Brian Bowden, and he's like, why are you scared? And I go, I don't know, man. I just, I just feel like one of these days he's finally going to let me have it. And Brian goes, dude, how funny would it be? If he let you have it at Kiss Mini Golf, think of the story. <laughs> I was like, what? <laughs> You're right. And I went from not returning a text for 90 minutes to being like, all right, I'm coming over. And when I walked over, Gene was entertaining a couple of people. He looks over at me and he goes, all right, go ahead. <laughs> you know you want to go. And I was like, oh, you, might, you want me to do a impression? Oh, 
All right. <clears throat> so <laughs> I, I do an impression of, of Gene, and I was actually given some really good advice many years ago, and Gene goes, that you're a fucking idiot? And I went, <laughs> oh, that, that was, um, I answered it like matter of factly, like, no, that was not it. <laughs> but <clears throat> I was, and I realized when I'm saying this that I've never said this in front of Gene. I said, given some great advice years ago, a friend of mine said, Hey, man, if you want to learn how to do that Gene Simmons impression, just watch Benjamin Netanyahu, the prime minister of Israel. <laughs> Hi, this is Benjamin Netanyahu from KISS. It's a secret. <laughs> and, and she started laughing, and I was like, all right. But, yeah, I I think that we all, all of us have had experiences where we uh, uh, rub elbows with people who we've all <laughs> really respected and admired. And we, and we learn to get over our, our uh, teenage, like, fanboy energy to just be able to chill out and – my experience now has been I'll be cool in the moment and then when I walk away I'll go, What the fuck? Was yeah. that? You know, I'll just like But that, he has that, to have a good sense of humor. I mean the man has a mini golf course after him, he has pinball machines, like he's living out every fourteen year old boy's dream. Like, yeah, I'll have a mini golf course. I'll have a, a you know, a pinball game after me. A coffin. You know what, to bring up, to, to really illustrate the point of this about him having a sense of humor, uh, you don't have to name any names, Don, but if I say to you, what artist have you had any interaction with that has no sense of humor about themselves whatsoever, is there a name that pops to mind? <laughs> um, I know this one. <laughs> you, you do? <laughs> um I, you know, I, I do, I have the name written down and it's, it's tucked into the, um, the, uh, circular saw blade that's attached to my waist. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Man. And let me ask a question. Is there a specific incident or story about that person that you can relate that shows they have no sense of humor? Well, it's Blackie Lawless from Wasp and he came on, <laughs> obviously, so... <laughs> I was going to be, was he somebody? <laughs> yes, he wants to be somebody. I love, I'm a huge Wasp fan. And he wasn't, a, he, he definitely was, you know, people always say who was a jerk. He was not a jerk. But the thing is, you know, and, and maybe it was more us three being idiots, but like he's long past those days where they used to like toss the red meat into the audience. Like they'd have buckets of red meat and throw in the audience. But we really wanted to do like the Harlem Globetrotters bit with him where we would get buckets of raw meat and we'd show the crowd while he was out there. And then, you know, then at one point he says some of the audience reacts and I go out there, but I grab the one that has the confetti in it and I throw it on the crowd and everybody goes nuts. <laughs> he was so fucking miserable that we were doing that because he hasn't done that. He hadn't done that in 20 years at that point. But, wow. uh, and he hates the Harlem Globetrotters. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was more of that, actually. He's a Washington Senators fan. He's yeah. or, <laughs> The generals, yeah. Yeah, the I, generals. I, I thought you were going to say it was the guy that threw the drink on you. The, oh, that. oh. Somebody threw a no, drink at no, you. Well, actually, that, was just, that was just a youth gone wild. <laughs> I gotta say, man, that dude uh, found out that I do an impression of him, and uh, I always showed, wondered about that. He showed up at a birthday party that I was at two weeks ago, and that guy <laughs> could not have been cooler. Walked right up to me and said, "Dude, fucking what? right. So just fucking let's. I want to film you doing that impression." Come on! Was it weird though that he was dressed in clown makeup? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and he was entertaining the kids and then saw you. <laughs> it was amazing. It was amazing. And, uh, yeah, that dude really surprised me how good of a sense of humor he had that um, about that impression. But uh, anybody but who didn't get that impression, go back. And uh, we had an episode where we were in Brick, New Jersey, and the night before we did the episode. We talk about who it was, and he was drawing penises on the wall of the studio. <laughs> really? Yeah. Just that, that military show that we did where we just saw a giant dick drawn on a wall. 
and it was like his. <laughs> and then Mark went over and just immediately started like stroking the side of it while Kevin was like, oh. Get me, yeah. <laughs> we're, dude, we're children. Like, it really doesn't are. matter that, that, you know, I have kids, I'm married, yeah. I'm a child. I, like, I, love, I, have... that, I love that Jer- Jeremy, Jeremy told, uh, told me back when those guys started playing with Gene a little bit more. Because Gene just, at first, it wasn't really a full-time gig. And let's also, let's set up the other guys, because the people at home watching might not know. The, the, the Phil and the Ryan that we're talking about is Phil Schaus. Uh, who also plays in the classic metal band, except now, and Ryan Cook, uh, guitar, vocals, um, fills in with Skid Row and stuff. So, you know, they all have their their other gigs, but all best friends, all started playing with Gene, their lifelong dream. But then you guys wanted to change up the songs after a while, but Gene was kind of resistant. So I, you guys had a little trick, right, where he, to make him want to oh, play was, songs, never, you would play them wrong in front of him, so he'd have to sh- show you how to he play was them. Never resistant. He was actually always down with it. His only request was like, "Do you have lyrics?" So we knew that if we had a lyric sheet, that definitely increased our chances of getting that song in. I mean, he was, you know, it, it took us a few shows to establish that too. So he was always game. And if you watch like those first three shows or so, you know, he's fucking up some lyrics pretty bad, but he was still, yeah, sure. Fuck it. Let's do it. I That's love awesome. that about him. And, you know, we, our first show was March 2nd, 2017. And our last show was September 25th, 2018. So in a year and a half, we did like 63 different songs. That's, that's a wow. lot, man. Damn. No Lots shit. of covers and deep kiss stuff. And yeah, man, it's a lot of fun. I like yeah. the spirit. And then he pawns you off like a groupie to Ace Freely. Like, kind he's of. just like, I'm done with them, Ace. You can have these chicks now. <laughs> and you don't miss yeah, a beat, but- right? You literally go right from out of Gene's band, walk across the hallway, and now you're in Ace's band. Well, it wasn't, it was even more than that. Like since that tour supporting both of them, it just sort of like lapped over. There wasn't a one to the other. They sort of just like did this crossfade (laughs) because we went to Australia as Gene's band, played with both of them, but then went to Japan with Ace from there. (laughs) It was like a home alone. You got on the wrong flight. You ended up with Ace Freely. <laughs> Gene so Simmons that, is wondering where his band is. <laughs> was that a planned? Was that a planned thing when you got yeah. over to Australia that you knew you were going to also jump over to Japan? Yes, yes. So, uh, so and, were you and, and Gene going was never part of the plan. Uh, I don't, Ace had just asked Gene permission to use us because it was not going to be financially viable for him to take his entire band over. And was it like a, a Chuck Berry situation? There's a there's a legendary story behind Chuck Berry that he would um, have a band in every city that he perform in that would rehearse the songs without him. Then he'd come up, do the gig, and then split. Was it was it similar to that that you were rehearsing with Ace, or did you actually get a chance to rehearse with Ace before those shows? I met Ace on stage. No shit! Yeah. Wow! <laughs> like pretty much every time. The first time we ever played with him was that uh that stadium show in uh, St. Paul with Gene and Cheap Trick and um, Don Felder. He showed up and did three, four, five songs with us, and I met him on stage there. And then the next time I met him was in uh, Adelaide, Australia, on stage. Wow. No Damn. Sh- I don't think I even talked to him until the end of the end of that Australian thing when Gene told him, Ace, you need to fire your band. And higher mind. <laughs> <laughs> you know. Wow. So that dynamic that you're describing, like, have you been in in the room and been a fly on the wall while those two have conversations about? It was awesome. Yes. Uh, <laughs> but, like hanging out in airports because you know we would always be pulled off privately and get to sit in private areas and and yeah, man, this was like before all that bad stuff went down and just sitting in an airport lounge listening to those two reminisce and bust balls and just hang out yeah man it was it was the type of stuff most kiss fans would pay top money for are you phil and ryan just pretending to have a conversation in the room absolutely we're just like sipping our coffee and like 
It <laughs> <laughs> just kind of with one ear towards the conversation. Like. <laughs> Now, did you get to, like, uh, since all of this kind of happened, start to hang out with the other guys? Like, uh, you know, the Bruce Kulik and what's his, Bobby Thayer? Bobby and, Thayer. Yeah. Honestly. And, like, have you guys all kind of collaborated on stories and talked about? Nope. Uh, <laughs> I haven't really had the opportunity to, to hang out with any of those guys for that long and you know that open of a setting i mean i've hung out with bruce a few times we've done lots of expos together and stuff and cruises and such but uh no we don't we don't really uh cross you know, paths and what about bobby thayer? <laughs> bobby thayer uh isn't that you're the comedian i don't have a joke for that one come on one of you comedians jump Jump on. I know that Jeremy knows this, though, and I know I've experienced this. Once you get into that KISS universe, you just get that uh, – you get to shave off a piece of that uh, loyalty and that support that you get from KISS fans who uh, will support you and, and uh, uh, you know, that the KISS army – You'll get like a, a piece of it, like a piece of that support from the Kiss Army. Do you, have you felt that that? that? that that is a really weird thing because, like, I am in the Kiss Army. I've paid for all of these events, just like you know everybody else. I've paid for, I've camped out for tickets. Like, if if I weren't in these bands, I would go see the Gene Simmons band. If 100%. Ace came to, I I go see Ace when Ace comes to town. So, yeah. you know, I'm just I have the benefit of being on stage with them. And it is a weird thing to be on the other side of the fence to where you're not like one of the guys anymore. You're they're wanting stuff from you that you want from Kiss, you know, whether it be <laughs> autograph photos or, you know, taking photos with people or whatever. I mean, I, I love that stuff. And I, I appreciate anybody who wants a second of my time. It, it's you true, know, too. It's uh, got, Guns N' Roses is the same way. You know, when I've gone out and uh, uh, toured with Hookers and Blow, which has Dizzy Reed from Guns N' Roses in it, anytime you tweet anything with his name tagged on any of the social media, you'll see it retweeted. Guns N' Roses Argent Fan Club Argentina, yeah. Guns N' Roses Tokyo, Guns N' Roses Guam, Guns N' Roses Montenegro, yeah. like... <laughs> those those fans are those same as the Kiss fans. They're they're like Dude, they're rabid. and they Die really hard. are because I, I've picked up some of those just from being in the Minefield Project with Todd Kurds. Like because I'm in that thing with him, man. Like all these Slash and Guns and Roses fan sites from all over the world yep. are chiming in on my stuff, and it, it is it is kind of mind blowing. I think one of the things we we all have in common is, <clears throat> you know, you definitely have to have a certain personality to to have that kind of interaction or have this relationship with people who are our heroes. You know, I went through it with, with dice. Um, you know, I did 10 years opening for dice and had I not been able to handle the ball busting from day one, he would have, he would have just tossed me to the curb, but that's what he does with everybody. He tests them out. And if, and if you can handle it, then you're in forever. You know, I mean, I, he's still one of my best friends to this day. But the first time I opened for him, he cornered me like 10 minutes before I was about to go on. And he got an inch from my face. I can see if I can. And he goes, <laughs> what do you do? <laughs> and I'm sitting there looking at my notes. And I go, what do you mean? What do I do? He goes, what are you going to say? On stage, I go, you want me to do my act right now? He goes, yeah, I need to know what you're going to say when you're up there. I'm like, holy shit. But I play it cool, and I go, well, I do this. I open with this thing about getting my hair cut. And he goes, okay, that's good. Do that. <laughs> All right. I do this thing about going to SeaWorld. And go, that's good. Do the SeaWorld. Go ahead. And he, he makes me go down my set list. I go out there. I've only got to do 10 minutes because he just wants to check me out. My first joke gets a zero. An absolute zero. So I'm like, it's over. If I if my first joke doesn't at least get some kind of laugh, it's he's done with me. So I'm miserable the whole set. The, now the rest of the set go, actually goes great. I actually the next joke gets about a, a six and a half, then and I'm getting eights and nines after that. But in my you know comics, we're like, 
-hmm. it's over. He hates my guts. I suck. I'm getting out of the business as soon as I get off stage. Everything's going through your mind. I'm, I'm beyond miserable. This is my idol, my comedy idol. I go in the dressing room. This is at the stress factor. You guys know how small that dressing room is. It is <laughs> tiny. And he's standing there with his back to me. And I'm just standing there. And he won't even turn around and look at me. I'm like, fuck, what the fuck's going on? All right, one joke didn't work. What the fuck? He walks past me to go to the bathroom. An inch away, doesn't even turn his head to look at me. Comes back, same thing. He's with his girlfriend at the time. And he goes... Put my jacket on. I'm like, man, this guy's pissed. I'm like, you know what? Fuck this guy. What, what that? What was I supposed to do? One joke didn't work. And then she puts his leather jacket on. And then she slaps the leather and goes, come on, tell the kid you liked him already. And he turned around. He's like, ah, you were great, man. I love the whale and the hair and everything. And, wow. But if I had cracked, he would have never used me again. So. Yeah, you know, the moment that I'm glad that Don told the story because Don just kind of casually says, uh, he goes, yeah, you know, I, I learned ball busting from Dice. That is such a casual <laughs> throwaway line because the level of ball busting that Dice does, no bullshit, is psychologically damaging to people. It's <laughs> of ball busting. And I know I, I might have mentioned this to you before, but my first time that I met him, I was, it was my first night ever performing at the Comedy Store. I, I had a few years under my belt doing stand-up in Seattle. Pauly Shore invited me to, you know, hey, anytime you want to come down, you can do a set. And I, I called up a few months later and said, hey, I, I'm, I'm going to come down. Uh, um, uh, is it still okay? And and the guy that I talked to that Pauly put me in touch with said, yes, anytime, any Sunday or Monday, you want to come down. I go, oh, Sunday or Monday. So I go down and they <laughs> Right before I go on stage, somebody goes, hey, uh, uh, Dice is here. Uh, do you want to go on before him or after him? And I was like, oh, I, I would love to go on after Dice. And they're like, is that okay? And I go, I would love that. And then Paulie finds out, and Paulie's like, dude, I'm going home. And I go, no, I'm going on right after Dice. And he goes, "He goes, you're never going on stage. I go, no, Dice is going on now, and I'm going to go on right after him. And he goes, he goes it ain't going to happen. And I'm like, what? <laughs> Dice went up and did a two-hour set and, <laughs> and intentionally alienated the crowd. Intentionally. We had, in that OR, the original, <laughs> probably a good 100, 150 people in that room. By the time Dice walked off stage, just trying to disgust people, it was maybe 10 people, six of which had come to see me. And uh, <laughs> I went up and did my thing, and then get off, and then and then I tried to talk to Dice, and Dice would not even turn and look at me. I said, "Hey, my name's Craig Gass. I'm a stand-up comedian," and he just kept staring. And I genuinely thought, "Oh, <clears throat> maybe I need to." <clears throat> I said, "My name's Craig Gass." <laughs> <laughs> and he still did not turn and look at me, and I just I looked at the stage with him, and then. And I just walked away. I just walked in. I was like, yeah, yeah. So, is there anyone that's even remotely close to that in the music business, Jeremy? That's just like, that's just, you know, relentless. I always thought, kind of thought Gene was that guy. I just, you know, get to peek behind the curtain a little bit, but he, he certainly comes off that way. I actually have experience with Dice. Uh, so Ryan and I, when we were in Big Rock show. Uh, did a week at vinyl in vegas when kiss was doing their residency and we went on after dice remember all that. week wow. so i can't remember if it was the last show or the second to the last show you know we knew the rule was you know dice has to be out completely out of the dressing room before we can go in totally cool with that. so he finished the show and you know he would always go out and do a meet and greet around the casino area the, right there by the doors right after a show so you know he was gone Looks like the dressing room was empty to us. Ryan puts his guitar back in the corner. Very unnoticeable. We take off. I guess Dice wasn't done with the room yet. So he let the sound man guy who kind of looked after vinyl have it. And then that guy let Ryan have it. Somebody's yeah. guitar was in the back corner of a dressing room that he wasn't sitting in. 
anymore. Jeez. Uh, yeah. yeah. So I'm scared of dice. <laughs> well, well, he is. The, the I, I, I will not show him that thing that you guys did. I will avoid him at all costs. Yeah. <laughs> Craig, Craig's right, up, though. His, his ball busting is is psychologically damaging because he does a thing that I, I I coined the twist up, which is he'll ask you something that you have no whatever the answer is, you're fucked, <laughs> and he knows it before he asks it. So we, we were in Detroit once. We're sitting at breakfast, and um, he was engaged to the girl that opens for him now, Eleanor Kerrigan. Great comedian. Great comedian. Yeah, who she really she's become a powerhouse on her own. But Dice was engaged. Used to be engaged to her, and we're sitting at breakfast one day, and he's like, he goes, hey, he goes, uh, didn't you used to fool around like w with Eleanor back in the day? Oh my God. And I go, I go, no, Dice, where'd you hear that? He goes, he goes, no, nah, I heard you, like you guys made out for like a little bit, like one time or something. I go, I go, no, that never happened, Dice. And then, and he goes, well, why? She's she's not good looking enough. <laughs> you wouldn't make out with her. What what do you say? I go, no, no, I wouldn't. Oh, you would make out with her. You would, you would make out with my fiance. So there's no way to get out of it. And you just you know, the longer you talk, the more you bury yourself. So I said, I go. This is the this is the twist up. And, you know, it's been the twist up for for ten years. You know what, Don? Don just makes a confession basically to where he came up with a fucking thing to bust my balls after we went to Europe. And um, there was, you know, the girl that that stiffed us in Europe, who was supposed to be our tour manager, and we found out early on in the tour when we were all talking to each other that we were all promised uh, different levels of reimbursement for for the tour, and we realized, oh man, we're getting hosed. And so it becomes this thing where it's like it's all the comedians against the tour manager trying to figure out how to get to the truth. What happened? A few years later, um, Don, uh, I was talking to Don, like, how fun was that? And Don was like, yeah, it was great. And I, I love that you told me that you fucked her. That was awesome. And I go, I didn't fuck her. And he goes, no, 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 no. You told me already. It's cool, man. It was yeah. <laughs> and I go, no, 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 you already told me you did, dude. It's great. I'm fucking happy. So I'm, I'm fucking proud to do that. And I'm like, I go, Don, I, I would have happily told you. If that actually, I mean, but I, I just, I thought it was so funny that Don really was committed to like, oh, no, 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 you're, no, 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 you, I, I know, I know. That's cool. Dude, Don was like next level acting when he was doing that to me. And I was like, <laughs> what are you talking about, dude? Like, yeah, dude. But, dude, well, with you guys, as this is a question I've always wanted to ask you guys, um, the three of you guys traveling, your best friends, you do get to know over all that time of traveling and being around each other what lines to not cross with each other and over time what are the things that you've just learned that like right i can't this is not funny to this person uh hmm. know, there's, there's not really a lot of that i can't really think of anything that's an impressive response there's really not a lot of that that you guys are all that copacetic. I, I feel like, and I've mentioned this to you before, since you've become a dad, there's a noticeable shift in that you've become the adult of those three. Yes, guys. exactly. Have you guys uh, noticed? Man, in a way, I, I kind of always was. That, that's just my personality. <laughs> you know, I don't know. I, I, I've got my foot firmly on the brake. Yeah, you know, I party, but, but, but it's interesting because it's subtle. Yeah, it's really subtle because Jeremy again is as copacetic. I'm glad, I'm glad you got to witness all like the dynamic. Yeah, progresses through the evening, and you know, from starting at seven o'clock with drinks and closing at I don't know midnight or whatever. I don't know how long we were sitting there or when that was, but you definitely got to sit on the front row. Well, Jeremy, you get, you got to pull back a little bit. You you described it as starting at seven o'clock. I, I don't know, like I don't know what time it was. I actually remember that day where we're texting each other and saying, "Hey, man, so we're going to get together at the hotel at this oh, time." Oh, yeah, o'clock. you're right. And then it was way go, earlier than seven o'clock. You go, you go, yeah, man. I'm hanging out with the guys right now at the pool, 
And I just happened to be scrolling through my Facebook page when I see Phil and Ryan shit faced at the pool at three in the afternoon. And I'm like, <laughs> this is going to be a, a good afternoon here. This is going to be a fuck yeah. <laughs> Some time leading up to the drinking time. You guys, you know, those two guys are already hammered. And you can tell that, that, that Jeremy is, is the adult in that moment. He's. <laughs> oh. Ryan's the Ryan's the party master. I didn't, I didn't master. say that, guys. By the way, Craig said that. He said. Yeah. <laughs> I, Ryan, I, Ryan's the party master. He's he's the guy that leads to the party. Like when we do the Monsters of Rock cruise and the boat docks somewhere, he he knows which beach bar to go to. Man, you know that line. We, that you got to catch a band over here to get there, and and it costs exactly this much. Like he knows, exa- he's the, you know, he's the Pied Piper for the party. Jeremy's the adult, and Phil's the stud. Yeah, yeah. What were we gonna say, Jeremy? That scene in Weird Science where uh, they're talking about Lisa and uh, Anthony Michael Hall's character said Lisa could have fun at an insurance seminar. That's Ryan. Ryan. Yeah. <laughs> Ryan doesn't go looking for the good time. It just sort of follows him. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's it, a little bit uh, I, because I know you do have to leave here in about ten minutes. I'd really like to talk to you a little bit about the uh, the tour with Alice Cooper, the most professional, smoothest, easiest, coolest tour we've all ever done. Man, it was it was amazing. I mean, have, you know, it was a little different being inside this COVID bubble and you know not interacting with anybody on the other side of the gate, but. You know, we've always been friends with the band. You know, we've been pretty close with them for a while. So, I don't know, that just kind of made for more hanging out with them. And there was no pressure to meet friends or family. So you could finish the show, pack your stuff, and put on your pajamas and stand at the side of the stage and watch Alice Cooper with drinks. You know, it was, <laughs> that, that was pretty fun. And I did that many times. By the way, did you... I Did you gonna... guys see he's um, Alice Cooper's trending right now all over Twitter? It says in a world, what is it? A, in a world of Eric Clapton's be Alice Cooper. Oh, because of that, <laughs> that image of Alice uh, serving food at a, at a shelter. Oh, he yeah, just yeah. seems like the greatest guy ever. Man, he is. And I tell you, man, he's the first guy up. Like every morning we get off the bus. And I mean, we're all early risers because, you know, we'd be parked at a hotel before we go to the venue. And everybody would be at the same hotel and his he carries a car behind his bus so that him and you know chuck and ryan and uh kyler his assistant they go golfing every morning every single morning and he's gone when we get up and you know he'd roll up the same time every day walk to the dressing room say hi to us and super friendly and what a professional I got to say, I feel like in the circumstances that you were in, and I saw each of you guys, I saw you and Phil and Ryan all posting, and guys who were in Alice's band were all posting, hey, man, this tour, unfortunately, would love to see you guys, but it's going to be a lockdown. We're not going to be able to have any guests, so sorry we're not going to be able to mingle because Phil and Jeremy and Ryan are all known as guys who are really accessible. They're always just, like, really – chill guys that you can you can always connect with and so you guys went out of your way to say hey we're not gonna be able to do this on, on this tour we're all in lockdown no guests allowed backstage but how often did it become a great thing to be able to go oh man i i wish i could but <laughs> <laughs> so, rules are rules man rules are rules dude like I said, we got off stage at eight twenty, and man, there were times I had my PJs on by eight thirty, yeah. with a shower in there. With a shower. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. That's hey, awesome. I, hey guys, I got to jump off, but um, can I end with a joke? Please, absolutely. And the reason I can end with a joke so confidently is because I have a copy <laughs> of Mark Riccadonna's book. Two guys walk into a bar, which is such a great concept. You got clean jokes on one side, then you turn it over and you have obscene jokes. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> Needless to say, it hasn't been turned over to the clean side. <laughs> Jacqueline I- Kennedy walks into a bar with her arm in a cast. 
Bartender asked her what happened. She said, I was helping Jack off a horse. <laughs> and Craig, you did fuck that chick. Good night. <laughs> that was a way to get off stage right that there. Was good, man. Amazing. Wow. Is- <laughs> wow. Press and hang up is the new mic drop. Yeah, <laughs> and I'm out, bitches. <laughs> yeah. I'm say, uh, there's Come a really on. Funny now, now that he's not here. Yeah, <laughs> you tell us. no, I didn't. I didn't. And and honestly, uh, I would have talked about it if I did. I would I would have been happy to tell the guys because you know I love a good story. So uh, I would have happy to talk about it. But no, I was uh, I was very happily involved in a relationship. <laughs> Uh, that I love very much. So, uh, but um, uh, see, girls, he's honest. Yeah, and um, uh, Jeremy did something that um, I haven't really talked to you about since it happened. But I didn't. It's really weird how you made me freak out in a moment when I didn't really have any reason to freak out, and uh, it was the last night of the Kiss Cruise, and something crazy happened. Where the last night on the Kiss Cruise, uh, and I've done this a few times before, I'm going to host a Kiss Q and A, uh, and it's pretty easy. You just stand on the side of the stage, and you just um, uh, bring fans up. Fans have a question: What's your name? Where are you from? Oh, my name's Dave. I'm from Pittsburgh. All right, Dave, what's your question for Kiss? And I just sit back and 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 allow it to happen. And if I see a good shot, I'll take a shot. But but I'm, it's not about me. It's about it's about this fan interaction. But it, it's a pretty awesome gig as a comedian because you're just kind of on a hilltop just facilitating this conversation and taking shots wherever you see it. And I find out the night before that um, the promoter says the band doesn't want to do a Q&A. They just want to talk to you. And I was like, oh, about what? And they, and they said, well, I don't, the band says you'll know how to handle it. <laughs> oh, okay. So the night before I find out, I'm just going to sit on a stage with Kiss and just talk to them. So I'm a little nervous about that already. And then and then I find out uh, 30 minutes before showtime that I'm sharing a dressing room with Kiss. The dressing room is only accessible by me and Kiss. We're all going to... Die from... <laughs> <laughs> you froze. We missed the whole last five seconds. Oh, and I, 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 I mentioned to Jeremy that I, I'm doing, um, uh, that I'm sharing a dressing room with Kiss, and Jeremy goes, "Oh, dude, can you do me a favor?" And I go, "Yeah, what's that?" And he goes, "Hang on, would you like me to take over here and give some backstory leading up to this because it's more than how you're going to." Yes. My Please. very, 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 very first record in the world is side three and four of a live two. It's autographed by Gene Ace and Peter. Yep. For some reason, man, me and Paul have a hard time connecting. It's just kind of always been that way. And uh, I brought this record with me because, man, I got to be honest. I don't know how many more chances I'm going to have to get this record signed by all four members of KISS. It's the original. Yeah. Original KISS. Yeah. My first record. I play with these two guys. It's a probably the more most important piece of history that I own in my musical path. So, you know, I don't know how accessible they're going to be. You know, they really are going to wrap it up. And I, Paul's tough for me to get to anyway. So I see my last chance because it's the last day. Craig, proceed. <laughs> well, so Jeremy goes, uh, he goes, he pulls out this album and I see three original signatures not just gene simmons ace freely and peter chris have signed this album and he goes the only one i haven't been able to get is paul and i immediately go oh okay cool and i go i go you don't want to ask him yourself and jeremy goes i'm scared and i go i'm scared to death of paul <laughs> I go, why are you scared he goes he goes i hope you don't mind me saying this he goes i don't know if paul likes me and for some reason, in that moment, I go, well, I don't know if he likes me. And then I get scared. <laughs> I go, fuck. I go, why, Jeremy, you're, you're like this fucking rock star. Why do you, why do you think that, that Paul doesn't, might not like you? And he goes, I don't know. I can't get a read on him. And I was like, holy shit, I can't get a read on him. And for some reason, I start spiraling 
off of Jeremy's insecurity about it. And I'm like, I'm so sorry. You I'm like, well, yeah. So, um, so he, and, and I still, I love Jeremy. So that's what I'm holding on to. I'm like, well, fuck, I want to do this because I love Jeremy. So, all right, give, give me the album. And then I walk into the dressing room and then in walk all four guys. And I'm standing there with <laughs> Um, and uh, and I, I I settle into some small talk, like, hey, so what do you guys? Um, uh, anything you want me to lead you to? Is there anything? And they're like, ah, just go out there and have fun. I'm like, all right, cool. I introduce them to my buddy Frank, and then it just gets quiet. And I go, uh, oh, hey, Paul. Um, question. Uh, I have uh, this album here that's just missing one signature. I got everybody except for one signature. Do you mind? And Paul goes, yeah, sure. And it just, and it was that casual. He just did it. And Doc McGee was just sitting there looking at us and he goes, he goes, I just, it's just missing one signature. In other words, hey, asshole, can you sign my album? <laughs> like Doc <laughs> that I had finessed it very casually and got him to do it. And dude, I felt so accomplished walking out of there and saying, I got it. I completed yep. the puzzle for you. But and it's man, it was like releasing a ghost or something. That's always been a haunting in my record collection and like on my walls. And yeah, what a solid thanks, Craig. Cause dude. Uh, <laughs> we, we did actually have a short conversation about the fear. And I remember telling him, like, well, just set it there and put the marker on it and maybe he'll see it and just like automatically sign That's it. That's right. That's right. Yeah. But it's so <laughs> crazy how Jeremy's like mild insecurity suddenly became something I needed to adopt when he said, I don't know how Paul feels about me. And then all of a sudden it dawns on me. Geez, I don't know how he feels about me. I, I don't know what that's going on. You know? And it's so funny. It's because there's such rock stars that, you know, and, and you see it over and over again through fans' eyes when you're around them in, in situations where they're talking to fans. You see people get nervous that you learn to adjust to. But, Jeremy, I know you need to get out of there, but uh, yeah. where do people find your shit and where do people go to get your music? Man, you can either go to my Facebook page, Everything's Under My Name, uh, or Instagram. I'm on Twitter, but I don't really tweet. It's kind of there. So if you try to interact with me there, you're not, you're not going to get much. But Instagram or Facebook. That's awesome. Pretty much yeah. the only places I am. It's hard enough to keep up with that stuff. I'm, I'm not that guy. <laughs> well, a, a real testament to how great of a human being Jeremy is, is how many people I've met in my life who go, oh, yeah, dude, Jeremy, dude, that guy's my friend. Like <laughs> thousands well, of people. I am, out that guy, I am that guy's friend. Dude, he didn't even correct me when I said Bobby instead of Tommy. So I, I – uh, Appreciate that. <laughs> Jeremy, you're awesome, dude. Thanks for doing this. You're the Greg, best. Man, it's good to see you guys. Merry Christmas. Happy New Year. Merry Christmas. And I hope I see you guys soon in Nashville or wherever. Somewhere. Absolutely, Absolutely, man. Well, All right, thank dude. you, man. Thank you for joining us. See you guys later. All right. That Craig, that was so... <laughs> dude, Jeremy should have ended by saying, and then you fuck that girl, Craig. And then hang <laughs> I, uh, dude, thank you for coming on. Um, just, I knew you and Don being on not only was going to be entertaining for me, but it was going to make him feel probably more comfortable than having me sitting there like, uh, uh, tell me some more. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm looking at your backdrop and I'm just thinking like you, your backdrop and my backdrop both clearly illustrate that we've made different life choices that uh, <laughs> uh, but wait look look i got the doors poster above the fireplace yeah i but, got the doors springsteen the ramones uh all back there so that's it's that still... because you have the uh, you got like clearly a holiday family set up behind you and i haven't told you this i'm in quarantine because i have covid <laughs> So, no shit. Yeah, I mean it's it's very mild. I'm triple vaxxed, but I uh, highly contagious uh, for at least the last few days. Um, you know, as as everyone's getting right now. So uh, instead of hanging out with my mom and my sister, uh, we're in Tucson where I'm at right now. I'm, I'm quarantining to uh, 
uh, to wait out these. Uh, my How time. long do you have in quarantine? Uh, I just got a couple more days. It's weird. My my time frame uh, from the uh, time my symptoms started, I'll be able to roam freely and not be contagious on Christmas Eve, which is like my last couple days in Tucson before I have to take off. So, yeah. So you get to see your... I get to see my mom and my sister, and uh, but I'm, I'm still a little concerned. I'm, I still want to be careful around my mom. So uh, yeah, but, I don't uh, blame you, man. It's yeah. scary. That is. I um well, let's. Uh, I- I'll give you a call because I have a thing Christmas Eve with uh, a virtual show with PlayStation Corporate. Okay, let's do it. Maybe you hop on Zoom with me, and we'll have fun. All right, you got it. I love you, buddy. Right, but I love you. We'll, we'll talk soon. That was Drinks, Jokes, and Storytelling, everybody. Thanks for joining us.